my brother and I were young, little guys, my parents decided that it was important to move us out to the country so that we wouldn't grow up among all of the challenges of suburbia. Now, I have to admit that in retrospect, uh, perhaps they had missed the fact that there are challenges no matter where you live. But they had moved us out to rural Virginia. We had a plot of five acres, and my mother loved to do gardening, with, which actually means she liked to send my brother and me out to dig and weed. <laughs> uh, but you know, my mother had a garden. My father used to cut down trees and split wood so that we could heat with our wood stove. But it was idyllic. Is that the word that, that I should choose? But, but hear me being slightly snarky as I say it. Now, right next door to the property that my parents owned was a huge parcel of woodland that was hundreds and hundreds of acres. And my brother and I used to go out and uh, ramble around. That was perhaps the true idyllic part of our growing up. There was a creek that flowed through the woods, and we used to go down there. And right next to the creek, as the hill came down, there was a, a massive pile of sods. And when I say massive, I mean 20 feet high, similarly broad. And in the winter, you know, those three days in Virginia when it snowed, we used to like to take our sleds out, and we would sled down the the slightly snow-covered pile of sawdust making our way down to the creek, and we always managed to stop short of actually ending up in it, which was good. You know, we never gave much thought to that sawdust pile. I never did, at least, until one year I came home from seminary and found that the parcel of land where my brother and I had rambled had been clear cut again. The beautiful woods where we had wandered were a wasteland. It looked almost like a moonscape. Yeah, that's where that pile of sawdust had come from initially. And I imagine that there is a future generation of children who will ramble in the woodlands there on a on a winter day and find perhaps an even bigger pile of sawdust that they can sled down. It's an image, though, that we need to hold in mind, because Isaiah, in this 11th chapter, talks about a shoot growing out from the stump of Jesse, new life coming from that cut-down tree. Now, if you back up to chapter 10, you actually find Isaiah talking about God clear-cutting Israel. It's a word of judgment where God says, look, you're done. The axe is lying at the foot of the tree. It's that same image that comes back to us in Matthew in the words of John the baptizer. A word of judgment, a word of destruction. But after the destruction, after the desolation, a word of hope. For from that clear-cutting from that stump, God promises new life and new growth. That shoot of Jesse, that descendant of David that we Christians see as Jesus. As we look back and we see God's action throughout the millennia. But today we have two texts that take place before Jesus. We have Isaiah speaking of hope, speaking of that day when death will be destroyed, when peace will reign, when the ox and the ass and the lion and the wolf and the fatling will dwell together in peace, when the little child will be able to place his hand on the den of the poisonous snake and be safe. It's a day that we all dream for. We come around to the image almost every Advent as we go through these texts together. We find ourselves asking questions to God 
God, when is this day going to be? Or is it really just a pretty picture that we carry in our mind's eye and our heart's hope? When is it going to be? Where is it going to be? And Isaiah goes on to tell of one who would wear funny clothes and would cry out in the wilderness. And then we jump forward to Matthew. We find John the baptizer, that guy who never manages to make it into one of the manger scenes. Maybe he should. But we find this, this man dressed in camel's hair with a strange diet of locusts and honey, crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. I think about this, this crying out, this shouting in the wilderness. I don't know if you've ever noticed when you go into the city. In Times Square, there's always at least one over by Port Authority, you find somebody usually, and maybe down by Penn Station, there's somebody, in the Grand Central, there's somebody. You know who I'm talking about, those people who stand there on the street corners preaching, handing out pamphlets, telling you how to be saved, promising destruction if you're not. It's a gospel that sounds very different from the one that we know a gospel of good news. But it seems there are always people out there crying out in the midst of the city, telling their version of the gospel. Now I have to tell you, if I were going to try and preach to a, a huge number of people, the city is where I would go. After all, with all the folks coming and going, you're bound to at least touch thousands over the course of the day. But Isaiah talks about one shouting in the wilderness. John embodies that vision of one shouting in the wilderness. I think, though, for Isaiah, it wasn't quite so literal. John, of course, took the idea and ran with it and embodied it. But I think that for Isaiah, he was talking about the foolishness of shouting in the wilderness. I mean, after all, who would do such a thing? Why would you go and preach to the clear cut? Why would you go preach to the rocks? Why would you go and just shout in the middle of nowhere? Isaiah could have, instead of talking about the sound of one crying out in the wilderness, could have talked about the sound of one beating one's head against the wall. Could have been. Because that's what shouting in the wilderness is. It's the effort of futility. It's the effort of frustration. It's what we do so often, isn't it? We live in a world of violence, and we want to change it, and it seems we can't do a darn thing. It's like we're beating our heads against the wall. We want to take care of those who are most in need, we want to be there supporting those fleeing their homes and violence. Yet it seems we can do so little. It's like we're beating our heads against a wall. We want to build a world where people have the freedom to live their lives. And it's like we're beating our heads against a wall. It's like we're crying out in the wilderness with no one to hear. Sometimes I feel like I'm getting a headache from beating my head against the wall. And I know you feel that way too. All the work that we do to make the world a better place and all the pushback that we get for it. But you know, Isaiah talked of one shouting in the wilderness. But John went and did it. He shouted in the wilderness. He cried out. He preached. <coughs> I expect that when he first started, 
he had nothing but rocks and bushes, and maybe a lizard or two to listen to him. Like St. Francis preaching to the birds, John the Baptizer went out and preached to the rocks. But you know, somebody heard about that crazy guy wearing camel hair and preaching to the rocks. Some Pharisee maybe got word of it and went out to check for himself. Hmm. Who's ever seen anybody do that? So the Pharisee went back into the city and told somebody. And next thing you knew, there were two Pharisees there listening to this crazy guy preaching to the rocks. And the next day there were four. And then one of the Pharisees let the word slip to a Sadducee. And the next thing you knew, there were both Pharisees and Sadducees, people from opposing parties out there watching this crazy guy preach to the rocks and to the lizards. And then the next day, there were 16. And 32, as each one of these people went back and told somebody else of this crazy guy out in the desert preaching to the rocks and the lizards with nobody to hear him. And before long, there were hundreds of people watching this man preach to nobody. It's sort of like Casey Stengel's line about how nobody goes to the ballpark anymore because it's too crowded. <laughs> was that Yogi? It wasn't Casey. Okay, I... It was like Yogi Berra, <laughs> who was quoting Casey Stengel <laughs> when he said that nobody goes to the ballpark anymore because it's too crowded. Or maybe it was Yogi quoting Casey. I'll arm wrestle you over that one later. But pretty soon there were so many people going out to watch the man preach to nobody that it changed the world. Have you ever watched somebody preach to nobody? Or maybe a better question, have you ever preached to nobody and found people watching? It's what we do. We preach to nobody until everybody listens. We tell the good news of transformation until the world is indeed transformed. Who to thunk it? But that's what we do. We cry out in the wilderness, we beat our head against the wall, we try and we do, and it makes no difference at all until it does. And friends, that's the gospel. The gospel that tells us that even the preaching to the rocks transforms the world. Let us then take courage this day. As we go about our lives, as we go about our work, as we share the good news of God alive and at work in the world. As we talk about peace and justice. Until it happens. Because one day, probably not next week, but one day, the world will be changed. Not through our actions, but through our faithfulness in following God's actions. Let us then be blessed as we live out the season of Advent as those shouting in the wilderness.